To watch these important lessons, subscribe to DP Education's YouTube channel right now. Click on the bell icon to stay updated on the latest lessons. Sri Lanka's largest free online school, DP Education. So, my dear children, in the earlier chapter, we discussed about the traffic movements. Within this chapter, we'll be discussing or we'll be mainly focusing about the second type of movements regarding the plants. So, the second type of movement is the nastic movements, my dear children. So, here within the second part, we'll be discussing about the nastic movements, nastic movements. So, in nastic movements, response of the direction does not depend on the direction of the stimulus. Direction of these movements are specific. So, within nastic movements, my dear children, unlike the trophic movements, there is no certain direction. The direction is specific. No matter the direction of the stimulus, the specific, there is a specific direction of the uh, response. Okay, there is a specific direction of the response. When you take the blooming of flowers, blooming of flowers, no matter from which direction this, the sunlight is going to fall, the response which is given is the blooming of flowers. The flower is going to bloom. So there is no specific direction or else we can say that there is no specific or there is no particular direction in it. Direction is always specific. There is no certain direction. Always what happens in that particular thing or the always what happens when flower is going to bloom is that blooming of flowers. That's it. So no matter the direction where the light is going to receive, the flower is only to know to bloom. That's it. Okay. So the direction of this movement is independent from the direction of stimulus. Okay. That is why it is called as a nastic movement. Nastic movement. So, in a nastic movement, my dear children, the direction is specific. There is no certain direction or else. The direction is identical from, right? The direction is identical. Direction is identical from the direction of the stimulus. Okay? Right then. Response is always towards a specific direction. The response is given always towards a specific direction. Response is always to a specific direction. That's it. There is a one certain direction. There is a one specific direction of the response. That's it. Okay. To that particular direction or to that particular way. Right. The response is going to occur. For another example, when I am going to touch the, plant, the leaves of the mimosa plant, it is going to shrink like this. When I am going to shake it like this, then the same thing is going to occur. If I am going to hit, by, uh, hit on that particular plant by using a stone, the same thing process is going to occur. There is no change in it. Okay. So, even though when I am vibrated, even though when I am touched, even though when I'm going to hit it by a stone, no matter the right, no matter the direction of the stimulus, always those leaves are going to, you know, shrink or else show the sleeping movement. So there is no certain influence between the direction of the stimulus and the direction of the response which is given. Right? Okay. So, response is always towards a specific direction irrespective of the direction of the stimulus. This reaction is not related with growth substances. So, this direction is not related with growth substance. That is the specialty in here. The reaction is not related with growth substances. Okay. 
So growth substances are not going to involve in nestic movements. Growth substances are not going to involve in nestic movements, my dear children. Okay. So it is important to know that. It is very important to know that these nestic movements are independent or they are free from growth substances. Those, those things do not need any growth substance, right? So therefore, these nestic movements do not have a direct influence or do not have an influence on the growth substances, okay? So the, direction, the reaction is not related with growth substances triggered by external stimulus okay then most of them are movements due to torture change ah so most of these movements occur mainly because of a torture change a pressure change position change right so Turgeo change is the main reason for these types of movements, my dear children, for the nestic movements. So if you take a nestic movement, always, my dear children, the nestic movements are going to occur due to a turgeo change, simply a pressure change, right? Pressure change or as a position change. Then in legume plants, structure called pulvinus, the structure called pulvinus, pulvinus. There is a structure called pulvinus in leguminous plants. Okay, in leguminous plants. So, this pulvinus is located as a swelling at the base of a petiole or leaflet. So, sometimes, my dear children, when you observe, you can, you, I think you have observed this thing, when you observe the mimosa leaf. Mimosa leaf is like this. At the petiole or else at the leaflet, there is a swelling part like this. Okay. So this is referred as the pulvinus. So this pulvinus located as a swelling at the base of the petiole or the leaflet. So during the motion of, right, during the motion of or during nestic movements, this Pulvinus can be seemed to have a swelling part. Okay, it is seemed to be as a swelling part during the nestic movements. Okay, so when you touch a mimosa leaf like this, it will bend down or else it will move or it will show sleep in motion or sleep in movement. So, in that case, you can observe that pulvinus with a swollen part, okay. Then, it contains parenchyma cells which move according to the changes in torture pressure. So, within this pulvinus, right, within this pulvinus, there is a special kind of cell. Right? Actually, there are several kinds of cells. Right? Mainly, it contains parenchyma cells. Parenchyma cells. Mainly, it contains parenchyma cells. Parenchyma cells. So, this pulvinus contains parenchyma cells which move according to the changes in turgid pressure. So, it contains parenchyma cells, my dear children. So, therefore, according to the turgid pressure in it, right, the parenchyma cells are also going to move. So, it will result the motion of these nestic movements, okay. So, the nestic movements are mainly occurring because of the turgid change, because of the pressure change, okay. So, pulvinus is the part that can be observed within the petiole or the uh, leaflet, right, which helps for these nestic movements, okay. So these turgid changes, right, are being controlled, I mean, not it's not like controlled, 
these torture changes are being detected by special cells which are called as parenchyma cells which located within the pulvines. So it are, those are the ones which helps for the movement, for these movements of plants, right, that happens due to the torture change. So these movements are referred as, my dear children, nastic movements, nastic movements. Right then, some, nest, some of nastic movements are as follows. So you are given with several nastic movements here, okay, several nastic movements. So number one given, nictinastic movement, nictinastic movement. So in a nest, nictinastic movement, my dear children, see, nictinastic movement is a nastic movement. So in here, sleeping or shrinking of leaves, sleeping or shrinking of leaves of Kathurumurunga, Kathurumurunga, Sesbenia, right? It is also called as Sesbenia. So sleeping or shrinking of leaves of Kathurumurunga or Sesbenia leaves, tamarind leaves, mimosa and nelly when dark falls. So when dark is going to fall, right? When dark is going to fall, right? When dark is going to fall, my dear children, there are several plants actually plant leaves, which are going to show a certain type of movements, a certain types of movements. Actually, these movements are referred as shrinking or sleeping movements. When dark is going to fall, these leaves are going into a sleeping movement. Albesia is also the same, right? Albesia. So these plants, these plant leaves actually show GS, show these changes or show these leaping movements due to having nestic movements or because of the nestic movements. So these nestic movements are referred as nictinastic movements, nictinastic movements. So when dark is going to fall in some plants, the leaves are going to show the sleeping movement or the shrinking movement. So examples are, my dear children, Sesbenia or Kathurumurunga, Tamarind, Mimosa and Nelly, right, Nelly. So these plants show sleeping movements when dark is going to fall, okay. So this is referred as the nictinastic movement, nictinastic movement. Then the next one, haptonastic movement haptonastic movement the second type of nastic movement my dear children haptonastic movement okay so let's see what do you mean by a haptonastic movement sleeping or shrinking of mimosa leaves sleeping or shrinking of mimosa leaves when the stimulus is touched when we touch a mimosa plant we know that Leaves are going to show the sleeping movement. Touching is enough. Like when you touch, it's going to show a sleeping movement. Upon a touch, if a sleeping movement is being shown, especially these movements are shown by mimosa plants, my dear children. So upon touch, upon touch, um, sleeping movement can, if a, if a sleeping movement can be observed within a plant, then this particular type of nastic movement is called as haptonastic movement. Haptonastic movement. Okay, haptonastic movement. So haptonastic movement occurs due to touch. The stimulus is touch. Okay, right. So haptonastic movement. Then the next one. Seismonastic movement, seismonastic movement, exhibiting sleeping movement during a shock. Uh, exhibiting sleeping movement during a shock. So when you vibrate or when you hit by a stone, you know that the mimosa plant is going to vibrate or it's, it's uh, or else a shock is going to occur within the mimosa plant. When you vibrate it 
or else when you hit by a stone right a vibration is going to occur or else a shock is going to occur so this more due to having a vibration or due to having a shock okay right sleeping movements can be observed within the mimosa plants my dear children so this showing of showing of sl uh, sleeping movement during a vibration or during a shock is referred as seismonistic movement seismonistic movement so these things specially can be observed within the mimosa plant my dear children okay within the mimosa plant seismonistic movement so seismonistic movements are occurring because of the vibrations or because of the shocks then the final one photonistic movement photonistic movement blooming of flowers with the sunrise blooming of flowers with the sunrise you know that when the sun is going to come out i took an example when i was discussing about the movements related to a plant when i was discussing it right we came or we took this example so blooming of flowers no matter which direction which the sunlight is going to fall there is no problem in it the flowers are going flowers are going to bloom flowers only know to bloom that's it so that's why it is called as an astic movement right there is no certain influence between the respond direction of the respond and direction of the stimulus so the next one would be right the final one would be blooming of flowers so these things are referred as photonistic movement i told you that photo means light so nastic movement photonistic movement so blooming of flowers is a photonistic movement so blooming of flowers with the sunrise can be taken as a photonistic movement so these are the types of nastic movements that we can observe within a plant mainly my dear children these things are going to occur because of a torch change right mainly because of a torch change so nictinastic movement slipping or shrinking of leaves in different kinds of plants because of the dark right or when dark is going to fall different types of plants there are different types of plants which shows the sleep in movement within the leaves so examples are nelly sesbinia o katrumurunga tamarind and albicia and also mimosa right mimosa then the next one haptonistic movement so in haptonistic movement when you touch a certain thing when you touch a certain plant especially mimosa plant when you touch mimosa leaves or mimosa plant right what will happen the mimosa leaves will go into shrinking movement or else sleeping movement so the stimulus is touching when you touch it it goes to the sleeping movement so if a certain plant is going to show sleeping movement upon touching or if a plant leaf is going to show sleeping movement upon touching that particular plant is showing haptonistic movement haptonistic movement then the next one seismonistic movement this is happening because of vibrations or shocks so when you vibrate a plant especially a mimosa plant you know that the leaves of the limos, mimosa plant is going to shrink or it's going to show sleep in movement when you hit that particular mimosa plant by a stone or any other object definitely it will uh go to sleep in movement the leaves of the plant will go to sleep in movement so that happens because of a shock so the movement or this more sleep in movement can be observed within the plant because of giving a shock or else a vibration so this is referred as a seismonistic movement seismonistic movement so seismonistic movements are occurring mainly because of the vibrations or else shocks then the final one photonistic movement photonistic movement so in photonistic movement my dear children when sunrise when sun is going to rise the flowers are going to bloom here this thing is going to occur mainly because of the light right mainly because of the light of the sun okay so 
photonistic movement is blooming of flowers upon sunrise or due to sunlight so these are the several types of nestic movements that we can observe within our environment my dear children or within our uh, within plants okay within plants in our environment so here remember nestic movements are always independent from the direction of the stimulus no matter whatever the stimulus no matter whatever the direction of the stimulus here the nestic movement is going to occur only to a specific direction it has an independent direction that's it right so these are the nestic movements then okay so like we studied about the right like we studied about the trophic movements in the earlier chapter now we are going to study about nestic movements my dear children okay so here you are given with a topic studying about responses of plant parts okay studying about responses of plant parts here especially we are discussing about nestic movements nestic movements so to study about nestic movements my dear children you will be needing a mimosa plant okay you will be needing a mimosa plant so mimosa plant mimosa plant is the one which you need okay so we are going to study about the nestic movements okay so when studying about the nestic movements you will be needing a mimosa plant you will be needing a mimosa plant right then so by taking or by taking this mimo mimosa plant my dear children we are going to touch and see what is going to happen we are going to vibrate and see what is going to happen okay so you know that it's obvious to us that when vibrating even in the last slide i discussed these things so when i'm vibrating the mimosa plant you know that definitely the mimosa plant will show sleeping movement when i'm going to touch the mimosa plant once again it will show sleeping movement mainly because of the nestic movements right so there is a structure called the pulvinus so pulvinus helps in detecting these turgor changes okay upon that these leaves going to show the sleeping movement right so my dear children what do you have to do is very simple first of all you have to vibrate the mimosa plant and you need to observe what is going to happen then you have to select another different mimosa plant because that plant is already showing the sleeping movement no so you have to select another different mimosa plant then you have to touch the leaves of that mimosa plant and observe what's going to happen okay so it's very simple to conduct this activity so what you have to do in your home go to outside go to your uh, go to your go, go to your external environment okay try to find out two mimosa plants don't uproot those things okay locate two mimosa plants vibrate one plant and observe what's going to happen touch the second plant right when touching these things you know that there are thorns so always remember to touch only the leaves huh? otherwise otherwise you will make you 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 may get hurt because of the thorns so you touch the leaves and observe what's going to occur to the leaves so it's very simple to conduct these activities my this activity my dear children so i'm not going to do this activity right i'm not going to conduct this activity as it is very simple and very easy okay so already know you you know what's going to happen but however my dear children as we are science learning students right as you guys are science learning students it's very important to follow up these things and to get observation to get relevant observations 
when I when we are going to discuss with the lesson part. So go to outside. Locate two mimosa plants. Touch the leaves and see what's going to happen. Vibrate the plant and observe what's going to happen for the leaves. Okay, so that's how we do this. To this, uh, that's how we go, how we are going to do this activity. Okay, then by that way you have to record the observations. So definitely remember to do this activity at your home, my dear children, and get observations. Okay, so I'm not going to do this particular activity within our laboratory as it is very simple as you can do this thing even in your out even in your home. Okay, right then. So let's head on to see the method. Method is very simple. I told you the two things. First of all. Locate, locate two mimosa plants. From outside, right? You have to locate two mimosa plants from outside, then Number two, vibrate a plant and observe and observe what happens. And observe what happens with leaf with leaves. Then the next one, next step. Touch. Touch the leaves. Touch the leaves of the second plant. And observe Touch the leaves of the second plant and observe what happens. Then finally, what do you have to do? Record your observations. Right? So once again, what do you have to do, my dear children? You have to locate two mimosa plants from outside, from your external environment, you have to select or you have to locate two different mimosa plants. Then what do you have to do? Vibrate a plant and observe what happens with leaves. You have to vibrate one certain plant and you have to observe what happens with the leaf or what happens with the leaves. Okay, that's the first thing to do. Vibrate a plant and observe what is going to happen or what kind of changes is going to happen within the leaves. Then touch the leaves of the second plant and observe what happens. Right? So in the second one, in the second plant, you have to touch the leaves. Carefully you have to touch the leaves. Then you have to observe what will happen to the leaves. Okay? What will happen to the leaves? Okay, so touch the leaves of the second plant and observe what happens. Okay, then finally what you have to do, you have to record the observations according to the, right, observations given out by the mimosa leaves. Okay, you have to record it. So like I said, my dear children, within your external environment, you have to follow up with this thing. You have to do this experiment in order to get the relevant observations. So it's important to do these things. At your home, it's important to do these things, my dear children. Okay.
so i hope that you will do this activity at your home okay right then so our observations our observations are quite simple number 1 when leaves when the when the plant is going to vibrate or when the when the plant when the mimosa plant is vibrated okay when the mimosa plant is vibrated leaves of the plant will show sleeping movement second observation is also quite simple upon touching leaves of the mimosa plant leaves will show the sleeping movement okay leaves will show the sleeping movement right then so we'll write down our observations my dear children observations are quite simple number 1 when vibrating the plant when vibrating mimosa plant right when vibrating mimosa plant leaves leaves show leaves show sleeping movement when vibrating mimosa plant leaves show sleeping movement this is the first observation that we took okay then the second one second observation upon touching upon touching leaves in the second mimosa plant leaves leaves show sleeping movement so these are the two observations right i hope that you did the experiment before i am going to write down the observations and you took the same observations like i did okay so it's very easy my dear children you have to locate only two different mimosa plants then vibrate one thing and touch the other one and observe it's very simple so once again what are our observations when vibrating mimosa plant leaves show sleeping movement okay upon touching leaves in the second mimosa plant leaves show sleeping movement leaves show right sleeping movement these are the two observations that we can take from the activity now we are coming into conclusions first one when vibrating mimosa plant when there is a vibration or else a shock right when there is a vibration or else a shock my dear children the nastic movements which are going to occur are referred as sesponastic movement so showing sleeping movement upon a shock or else a vibration is a sesponastic movement this is a sesponastic movement then the second one upon touching leaves in the second mimosa plant shows sleeping movement right so when touching if the sleeping movement is observed such as such a movement is referred as haptonastic movement haptonastic movement 
So my dear children, this one, when vibrating mimosa plant leaves show sleeping movement. This is a seismonastic movement. This one, upon touching leaves in the second mimosa plant, leaves show sleeping movement. This is a haptonastic movement. So within the conclusion we can write, it's quite easy. Sleeping movement Sleeping movement given by leaves upon touching upon touching is a haptonastic movement. So, the first and foremost conclusion, sleeping movement given by leaves upon touching is a haptonastic movement. Upon touching, if the sleep and move, if the sleep, if, if the sleeping movement or the sleeping movement is being shown by the mimosa plant leaves, then that is a haptonastic movement haptonastic movement. Then the second one my dear children. So second one in here because of the right because of the vibrations. So if it is going to occur because of the vibration then it is a seismonastic movement. So second one sleep in movement Sleeping movement given due to given due to sleeping movement given due to vibrations. Sleeping movement given due to vibration is A seismonastic movement. Right? So here you can see that sleeping movement given by leaves upon touching is a haptonastic movement. Sleeping movement given due to vibration is a seismonastic movement seismonastic movement so these are the two types of movements that we have identified the two types of nastic movements that we have identified from the activity my dear children one thing is going to occur because of a vibration the other is going to occur because of a touch if it is going to occur because of a vibration then it is a Seismonastic movement it is going to occur because of a touch, then it is a haptonastic movement. Okay. So these are the nastic movements then. The nastic movements. Right. So when you touch a mimosa plant, the leaves show sleep in movement. It is a haptonastic movement. When you create a vibration without touching, the leaves of the mimosa plant show sleeping movement or the sleep movement. It is a seismonastic movement. So like I said, because of vibration, seismonastic movement occurs. Because of a touch, haptonastic movement occurs. The pulvinus located at each leaflet and the petiole base help for these movements of the plant. Pulvinae are also present in plants 
showing sleep in movement as dust with the decrease of sunlight. Actually, here it is given as dust, but it should be dusk. Right, so within the textbook also there is the there is a mistake, my dear children. Here it should be dusk, not dust. Okay. So dusk means low amount of light, right? So in the evening, like around six to seven time period, six to seven pm, the dusk is going to come. Dusk means the less amount of sunlight, low amount of sunlight. Now upon setting of sun, low amount of sunlight is going to receive. So that time period is received as the dusk. Okay, so during the dusk also, or when uh, these pulvinae, which is present within the plants, also showing sleep in movement because of the dusk. Dusk means decrease of sunlight, like I said. Okay, so there's a small bit of a mistake in your textbook, so you have to recorrect it. So these movements can be observed within Katurumurunga, Tamarind and Nelly plants. So we discussed these things in the earlier uh, lesson part as well. Okay, so this, uh, this movement because of, because of receiving less sunlight or because of dusk, right? These motions can also be observed my dear children. So these motions can be observed because of having that pull vine eye. Right, pulvinae. Okay, right then. So these are the locations of pulvinus, right, where the pulvinus has been located. So it's easy to observe when you take a petiole or else the leaf, uh, base of the leaflet, you can observe a swollen part. So that swollen part within the swollen part, you can observe the pulvinus. Okay, right. So these are the nastic movements, my dear children. The nastic movements. Right then. So for extra knowledge, a certain type of a movement, another type of a movement is given. Tactic movements. Tactic movements. So here it is given, in addition to trophic movements and nastic movements, there is a type of movement known as tactic which is related with the direction of stimulus. In tactic movement, the whole organism responds to the stimulus. So in a tactic movement, my dear children, what happens? The whole organism is going to show. The entire organism is going to show a certain movement. Actually, entire organism is going to move from one place to another during a tactical movement. Okay. Example given, Chlamydomonas. Chlamydomonas. So, tactic movements can be observed within the Chlamydomonas. So, let's imagine that the sunlight is going to come from a certain place. Right. So, Chlamydomonas is a type of an algae. You know that. Okay. So, as it is a type of an algae, it can do photosynthesis. So, to do photosynthesis, it needs sunlight. So, when sunlight is going to come, Chlamydomonas is going to travel to that particular place, right? Chlamydomonas is going to travel that particular place. So, this movement is referred as a tactical movement. Here, the entire organism is going to move to the direction of the sunlight okay to the direction of the sunlight the tactical movements so chlamydomonas is an organism who is showing tactic movements okay tactic movements right so here my dear children it is special that the type of movement known as tactic which is related with the direction of the stimulus here, it is related with the direction of the stimulus, okay, these tactical movements. Right then, so these are the movements that we can observe within the organisms, my dear children. So we discussed several movements related to the plants as well within this chapter, okay.
right then. So we discussed several things, several information regarding the movements within this chapter, my dear children. We discussed about the trophic movements mainly. Then after that, we discussed about the nastic movements, right? We discussed about the trophic movements. We discussed about the nastic movements, right? Then after that, bef af uh, then after that, we discussed about the things which help for the nastic movements. Especially we discussed that the pulvinus located within the leaf base and also within the uh, petiole, right? So the pulvinus is the one which is going to help for the nastic movements. So it contains a special kind of a cell which is referred as the parenchyma cells which helps to detect the turgid changes. So nastic movements are the changes or the movements that occur because of the turgid changes or else simply we can say that the pressure changes. Trophic movements are the movements which occurs with the direction of the or due to a influence of a certain stimulus. Speciality here is that during trophic movements, the direction of the stimulus is going to influence to the direction of the uh, to the direction of the movement but however in the nastic movements there is no certain influence in it right there is no certain relationship between the response and the stimulus always in a nastic movement the direction is identical or direction is same right no matter no matter you are going to change the stimulus, the direction is identical, direction is same. Always it is going to do a one certain, uh, a one certain movement, that's it. So this particular type of a movement is a nastic movement. So these are the two main types of movements that we can observe within a plant, my dear children, okay? Right, my dear children. Then after that, we studied about a special kind of a, movement regarding the organisms so that movement is given in here which is referred as the tactical movement so tactic movements the whole organism is going to move to a certain stimulus example is chlamydomonas so these are the types of movements that we observed within the plants my dear children right but however this tactical movement is somewhat differ it's not related to the plants remember right then after doing that part my dear children we have finished up the nastic movement part now it's time to start a fresh new lesson part here we'll be discussing about in situ conservation in situ conservation right although plants show movements they cannot locomote like animals Animals can avoid external hazards by locomotion, right? This was, there's a speciality among the, uh, between the plants and animals, my dear children. We discussed that plants can't locomote. However, animals can locomote. Speciality here is that when you take an animal, as the animal can locomote from one place to another, animals can be free from different kinds of predators, different kinds of other hazards, environmental defects, and so on. Now let's imagine like this. Suddenly an earthquake is going to occur and now the earth is going to separate into two different crusts. So what will happen? Within the area that the earthquake is going to occur, the crust is, get, crust is getting separated into two parts. Now all the plants who all the plants which are located between that area definitely going to destroy. But however, the animals who are living in that particular area definitely will run to a different place. So my dear children, from that natural disaster, animals can save their lives. But however, plants will not be able to survive. It's mainly because plants can't locomote from one place to another, right? So therefore, 
it's a huge disadvantage for plants because they will not be able to survive because of external hazards okay so the locomotion is very important for an organism it's very important for an organism even for the survival also this locomotion process is very important sometimes those things are very beneficial sometimes the locomotion is very beneficial for the survival one example is that which i have to that is quick case okay so when you take plants plants are going to face more hazardous conditions within our environment as they can't locomote from one place to another but however animals when you take animals animals has the ability to locomote from one place to another so therefore they face very less amount of hazardous conditions okay less amount of hazardous conditions but for a plant right it's going to be a terrible condition my dear children so therefore it's important to protect plants okay it's important to protect plants we are humans we have a good brain or else we have a good intelligence so therefore we should know who are the organisms which are very much valuable for the environment for the survival of the environment so plants is a such organism so my dear children it's important to protect these special kinds of plants plants grow in a habitat where all necessary external factors needed to growth are present hence plants can be get destroyed in in its habitat due to external hazards therefore it is essential to conserve plants in its own habitat so like i said my dear children we have a greater responsibility in conserving organisms who are pretty much valuable for the environment for the survival of the biosphere right as we have the good as we have a good intelligence we have a good brain so it's very important to conserve our environment especially from the external hazards right if there is an earthquake which is going to happen we won't be able to save those from those kind of cases but however if you take other hazards right mainly these those are natural incidents no let's imagine let's take a forest now within a forest my dear children you know that plants or the there are several trees which are grown heavily i mean like those trees are much very huge so there can be several other types of right several other types of humans right these humans may smuggle or else they will try to cut down these trees for their basic needs sometimes for any other other cases okay other different cases so in that case my dear children these special kinds of plants will get destroyed from the forest so let's imagine that it is a native plant what do you mean by a native plant native plant means that particular plant is growing only within a certain area or within the certain country right if that plant is growing within a certain area then if these plants are getting destroyed like those kinds of incidents then my dear children we won't be able to locate these plants in a different place because those plants are native to that particular place so therefore these plants will be totally getting extinct from the world as these things are native for that particular place so natural disasters are also a causative thing for the destruction of these plants but however most of the times my dear children humans are the ones who are going to influence for the survival of these special plants 
or these special organisms, trees, especially. So it's important to protect these plants from those external hazards. Okay. So in order to prevent these external hazards and to protect the plant, protect the trees within their own habitat. Now we can't take these plants to a different location. We can't take these trees to a different location as they are native to that particular place. As these things are native to those particular place, we can't move these things here and there. There's no possible way to move these things here and there. So it's very important to protect these plants within the environment that they are living in. In that case, what are the measures that you can take? One thing is, we are declaring that this is a reserve. No one can't enter. Then we are covering or we are going to uh, we are going to uh, separate that particular area so that the other people will not go to it. If the other people are going to go, then the law enforcement, right? The law enforcement will give the suitable punishment for those guys. So that is referred as a reserve. So we can, we can protect these plants by declaring the certain area as a reserve, okay? So my dear children, in situ conservation means within the certain environment which the plants are growing, which the trees are growing, we are conserving the plants or we are conserving the trees. So here, let's see the other things. Conservation of an organism in its living environment, is known as in situ conservation. So within the living environment, my dear children, we are conserving that organism. This, this condition applies not for the plants or trees, but for animals as well, right? But for certain animals, but for certain animals also, we can apply this particular method, the in situ conservation. Right? So, in situ conservation can be used to protect an organism within its own habitat. Within its own habitat. Right then. Strictly reserved forest which protect indigenous plants like ebony, satinwood, vitex are examples for in situ conservation. So, reserved forests, I told you that if you need to protect a certain plant or else a tree within a certain environment, the best thing to do is that we are going to declare that particular area as a reserve forest. We won't be able to do that thing. There are certain authorities who can do. So, if there are certain important plants, indigenous plants then we have to inform for that particular authority then those authorities are going to declare that this thing as a or this particular forest as a reserved forest so by that way if it is being reserved then the people can't the normal people can't enter for that particular area law enforcement should be uh, law enforcement will punish if they if the normal people are going to enter to that particular reserved forest okay so by that way we can protect by that way we can protect the trees and the plants which are located within that certain area okay so especially these reserved forests okay especially these reserved forests or reserved areas which the plants are going to live these areas have indigenous plants, indigenous plants, native plants. Indigenous plants, indigenous, indigenous means native. For that particular area, these plants are native. Okay, that means we won't be able to find different other places that has the same plant. Okay, so examples 
four indigenous plants are given ebony, satin wood and white eggs. So these plants, we can conserve these plants. These plants are very, I mean like when you take in Sri Lanka, ebony, satin wood and white eggs are indigenous or native. In Sri Lanka, these plants are native plants, native to Sri Lanka. So within Sri Lanka, we can find out these plants, okay? And within Sri Lanka only, we will be able to find out. So these plants can only be found in Sri Lanka, okay? So it's important to protect these plants. It's important to protect these plants, my dear children, okay? So here, ebony, satin wood, white eggs are examples for in situ conservation. Then, these species of organisms can be protected by conserving sensitive zones of the environment. So sensitive zones means those reserves. So we can conserve these things. These reserves can be conserved. So upon conservation, we can save these things or we can save these plants, my dear children. So it's important to save these plants. It's mainly because these plants are only limited to a certain area. So therefore, by protecting these plants, we'll protect the whole species, okay? Right, so this is referred as the in-situ conservation. Conserving a certain organism within its own habitat is referred as in situ conservation. Right. So, this is the willpath to reserve. The willpath to reserve. So, like that way, there are several reserves in Sri Lanka. One example is willpath So, in willpath to reserve, we can observe those kinds of plants and different other kinds of unique animals as well. Okay. Especially, there are several indigenous plants within the Vilpatu Reserve. So, there are several other reserves, right? So, these reserves are protecting indigenous plants and animals who are limited to Sri Lanka, my dear children, okay? Right. So, this is referred as the in-situ conservation. So, in the early year, you are given with several examples regarding the plants. So this is ebony. So ebony plant specialty here is that when you take the wood of the ebony plant, it has a certain black color, a unique black color like this. So this plant stem or this plant wood is very valuable, much valuable. Okay. So this is ebony. And the white X plant, right? The white X plant. Then here, the satin wood. Satin wood is also having a good wood value, satin wood, right? So ebony and satin wood are having very good wood value. So therefore, most of the people, they tend to cut down these trees. And these things, these species are now being endangered. Okay, so it's very important to protect these reserves and very important to protect these organisms, especially these plants. So we won't be able to observe these plants in other places, my dear children. Okay, so it's very important to protect these plants. So these are the examples for those kinds of plant species which we can save through the in-situ conservation, right? Okay. So my dear children, with that lesson part, we have come to the end of our lesson, right? So we discuss all the things related to the lesson part. We, first of all, we, uh, we discussed about the different kinds of appendages used by different kinds of animals for the locomotion. Then after that, we discuss about the appendages used by the animals and microorganisms. We discussed about the joints, elb, uh, joints, muscles and bones and especially we focused about the elbow joint regarding the movements of human beings. Then we discussed about the plants, movements in plants. We discussed there are 
two types of movements in a plant, trophic movements and nestic movements. Then we discuss several examples for trophic movements and several examples for nestic movements. Then finally, we studied another type of special type of a movement, which is referred as the tactical movements, right? Then finally, we studied about the in situ conservation, protecting a or protecting an organism within its own habitat. So these are the key things that we have learned within the lesson part, my dear children. Right now, it's time to discuss the summary of the lesson. Animals use pseudophodia, cilia, flagella, and muscles for their locomotion. So, my dear children, animals like amoeba, they are the ones who are using pseudophodia. Pseudophodia means false legs. Their body shape or the cell body can be turned into several kinds of feet. So, these feet helps in locomotion. However, these feet are false feet. That's why it is referred as pseudophodia. So, amoeba has pseudophodia. Then the next one, cilia. Cilia is the type of appendages that is observed in paramecium. Cilia is hair-like structures. So, these hair-like structures can be seen all over the body of, cell body of the paramecium. So, these hair-like structures help for the locomotion of paramecium. Then the next one, flagella. Flagella can be observed within the body of euglena. It's like a th thread-like structure. Then by waving thread-like structure here and there, the euglena can move from one place to another or it can locomote. Then muscles, muscles. Invertebrates use muscles for their locomotion mainly. Invertebrates like snail, leech, earthworm, right? Those organisms use muscles for their locomotion, muscles. Then, crawdates. Crawdate means vertebrates, my dear children. So, crawdate use bones and muscles connected to the bones for the movements. So, we discussed that crawdates are going to use muscles, and as well as bones for the movement, right? In order to move or in order to show locomotion, they use both muscles and move, bones, okay? Both muscles and bones. Then the next one. For a movement to take place, muscles must have the ability to contract, stretch and recoil together recoil to their original resting length after stretched or contracted. For a movement to take place, for a movement to take place, muscles have the ability to contract in order to take place a movement. Muscle must have the ability to contract. Muscle should contract, okay? Or else stretch and recoil to their original resting length after stretched or contracted. So, when muscles are getting contracted or when they are coming to the original place, what will happen? A movement is going to take place. A movement is going to take place. Skeleton system and the muscles give the body a shape and a rigidity. So the skeletal system and the muscles contained within the body gives a rigidity to the body, give a, give a mechanical support to the body. That's how we stand like this. Okay. Then, even though plants do not show locomotion, they show different movements. So we discussed that even though the plants are showing, even though plants are not showing locomotion, Plants can show different kinds of movements. Movements of plants are categorized as trophic movements and nestic movements. So trophic movement means, my dear children, a movement that has an influence between the direction of stimulus and the direction of respond. 
mainly these things are going to occur because of the action of growth substances, trophic movements. Then nastic movements, my dear children. Nastic movements are mainly occur, main, mainly occurring because of the turgid change or pressure change, right? Mainly the pulvinus located within the petiole or the leaf base, right? Helps for the nastic, nastic movements, okay? So trophic movements and nastic movements. Then finally, conservation of an organism in its living environment is known as in situ conservation. So if a certain animal or as if a certain organism is protected within the environment that the particular animal or the organism who are living in, right? If that particular animal is protected within the living environment or within the living habitat, then my dear children, this method of conservation or this method of protection is referred as in situ conservation. Most of the times, indigenous organisms can be saved from the in situ conservation, right? So during in situ conservation, my dear children, we discussed that most of the times reserves are being separated from a certain area. So within these reserves, these indigenous or native plants and animals can be observed. So, so, so this is what do you mean by the in situ conservation? So this is the final part that we discussed under the lesson. So we have finished all the theories related to the lesson part, my dear children, the eighth lesson, movement and the support of the organism. So within our next chapter, we'll be discussing the questions related to the lesson part, okay? So stay with me, it's not finished yet. Right? So it's important to discuss, discuss the questions related to the lesson, my dear children. So by that way, we can replenish our knowledge quite more. So I hope to meet you with our next chapter with the questions part. To watch these important lessons, subscribe to DP Education's YouTube channel right now. Click on the bell icon to stay updated on the latest lessons. Sri Lanka's largest free online school, DP Education.